this really kicked in right around March 14th, give or take the dates, uh, when Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, all were very quick to implement work from home. And we've seen in those areas an immediate surge in those localized areas of anywhere from 30 to 65 percent. COVID-19 completely flatlined our business. I, I'll never forget it. It was March 12th. The emails started rolling in. Uh, hey, we're canceling this week. We're canceling next week. We're canceling our weekly Fridays for now. Once Opera America closed its office on March 15, and we started to work remotely uh, on March 16. Um, we were gearing ready to, to go to for, for a full season, but um, you know, unfortunately, you know, more important things were, were happening and going on, and so everything else really took a back seat. We very quickly coordinated uh, video visitation opportunities for um, the individuals in our care. In, in February, we did 1,600 virtual encounters across the whole system. And by April, we were doing 60,000 a week. Next couple of days after the 15th, we had Monday off, Tuesday, Wednesday, we went to school and actually did some planning for remote learning. We coordinated the like sending out of laptops to students and picking up things from students' lockers because we didn't know when we'd be back. And then starting that following week, we were up and running with remote learning. When COVID hit, we literally went from like, you know, one to 2% of our patient visits being on telehealth to 100%. And, uh, Wow, what a change that was. I, I hate to sound overly dramatic, but the internet has been almost as important as breathing air, uh, essentially, because the ability to stay connected and be connected in a place where you have to forcibly be disconnected uh, is incredibly important. Uh, you know, from being there at 18 days in quarantine, uh, where I literally could not leave my house, to the fact that we have to social distance, to the fact that you know traveling is very difficult. What we're seeing is that there was an incredibly efficient way for us to communicate that we weren't really tapping into. Individuals being so thankful that they were able to visit virtually with their loved ones. They were able to see the inside of their parents' house that they haven't seen in many years. They were able to um, you know, do a virtual walkthrough of, of their daughter's uh, newly purchased home. Um, they were able to see family pets and, um, and you know, just, just see different things that they wouldn't have seen with an in-person visit. Doctors and patients both stepped up to accept and work with this new model of care delivery and make it work. And we've heard only good things from both sides, patients and doctors, about how well it went. These are all new opportunities to explore for meeting the needs of people who are in great distress. For them, they're sitting there at home. The people, their caregivers are right next to them. Their dog is at their feet. Their cat is on their lap. They didn't have to rush around. And it, it's wildly more efficient to just drop in with people while preserving the boundary between them. Literally just being able to, you know, plug up via ethernet and just go and race. And um, really just being able to race with people, you know, across the country and across the world, whether it's, you know, pro sim racers or cup series racers that race on Sunday. And so um, really being able to compete with them was, was very big to be sure that, you know, I wasn't, you know, slacking off and um, being able to, you know, constantly be working. The staff has really found a new way to work together and in some ways work together more effectively than in the office where the geographic definition of departments kind of acted as silos and those silos feel much deconstructed uh, in all the ways we've been connecting. Network performance, uh, it was, it's been flawless, I mean, and uh, it uh, makes me both proud and, uh, and so pleased with the investments that we've made in advance. And in the small number of areas where we've had hotspots due to just incredible surges in traffic, or we got combined with tornadoes that came through and other pieces where customers uh, really needed the service brought back, we had our staff working around the clock in some conditions that were incredible. And while we were sheltering in place, we had these people on the front lines uh, 
replacing fiber optic cable, putting in new plant, and ensuring that customers were back in service. We are designing a clinic that will be used for testing for the COVID virus and more importantly for researching the virus. And we are designing our clinic using origami. There's a digital divide in our community. We know that, you know, people who are wealthier have access to better uh, technology, have access to better, uh, uh, you know, bandwidth speeds, etc. And that's something that in terms of equity and in terms of creating a fair society and a more just society, we have to continue to work on to make sure uh, that we have uh, you know, the tools that every child has the tools to be successful and that every adult has the tools to be productive for their family. There are huge gaps in terms of like student literacy skills in terms of their computer use capability. Like, it's already frustrating to not be in the classroom and not be social with your friends. It's even more frustrating to have to learn online. It's especially frustrating to have to learn online and not know how to use the tools that you're being asked to use. Yes, I'm doing all telehealth, but that also includes phone only visits. And so I have, I would say probably 60% um, video audio, and then the 40% is audio only. Um, so absolutely, we have a huge digital divide. Just talking through your ideas, you can't do it in person, like at the same time, and like, it's not as dynamic as it could be. But when we do the next step, which is the full scale model, it's pretty much impossible to do it individually like this. So actually a professor even said, if we aren't able to go on campus, we'll just have to wait until we can. And that's a little discouraging because the whole point of this is to help with everything that's happening. Part of the pleasure of going to live performance experience is the crush of people in the lobby before and the buzz at intermission as people talk about the performance that they're, that they're attending. We don't have that experience uh, in the digital platform, at least not yet. Some of these tools are quite expensive and to roll them out across an entire university, a major educational institution, requires a lot of financial capacity. And also you have in the academy still a culture of traditional learning in many places where instruction has to be in person and it must be done in a certain sort of way. So for example, in some other law schools, you know there's a belief that you can't carry out the Socratic method online. And for, for us to be now functioning within this interesting new frame, where we can look at everything we bring to it. We can look at the production values. I can look at my lighting. Do I wear my glasses or don't I? What do I have in the background? How do I look at the camera? When do I lean in? When do I lean back? These are all new opportunities to explore for meeting the needs of people who are in great distress. And I think one of the underlying advantages of the moment is that we get to experiment without really knowing a lot. Uh, because in this crisis, as we are trying new things, we can admit that some worked and some didn't work, and we're all experimenting right now. And so I have about 50 virtual backgrounds, and I let the kids pick um, what goes behind me. Um, and so I'm an autism doctor, so they're not always interested in talking to me. So it helps actually quite a bit, because if they are interested in a particular thing, then I can stick something behind me and get them to actually look at, like talk to me. Um, whereas in person, they don't always engage with me. So I've actually seen better engagement through Zoom than I did when we were in person. Uh, we love the internet. We love all the opportunities that are coming our way. And we're really open to see how else we can use that the tablets that are in a controlled environment. How can we bring education into that piece? Like lots of things. The mission of our opera companies has been to provide great performances of opera for appreciative audiences. I think right now we are seeing uh, necessity become the mother of invention where the live performance format is unavailable to us, there is a sudden necessity to experiment with alternatives uh, and it has blown the doors open. Um, so it's been a, a unique pivot for us. Um, I would say that now with the recent spike in cases and people being forced into a work from home model and realizing that they can be just as efficient as effective in most verticals, that it, this might become more of a long-term thing. We 
didn't really have a choice. We had to take care of people that were stuck in their homes. The government helped us in three areas. Uh, one was the um, relaxation of some regulations around reimbursement so that doctors could get paid for uh, video calls, auditory only calls, remote monitoring, etc. The second was regarding uh, technology and uh, HIPAA regulations. And for the time of the public health emergency, you can use more or less any platform you want to communicate with your patients. And, and they've said they won't enforce HIPAA during that time. Third one is state licensure. And now 49 out of 50 states have special provisions that they've enacted to enable doctors to care for their patients across state lines. And people kind of like it and they're not they're not uh, envisioning going back to uh, one channel, which is come see me in the office. I am very hopeful that our policymakers and our insurers will understand how important access to telehealth is. Most of my families drive an average of two hours to see me and my no-show rate is way down now that we're doing virtual visits. It's almost zero at this point because why i mean the families now and they, they tell me this they're like this is great i don't have to drive two hours each way i don't have to have gas money i don't have to take off work i can see you in my own home right all of these benefits and so i'm really i'm going to be advocating to payers and to um, legislators that this is vital uh, to our our patients and to our communities and it honestly is very effective we don't believe that a return to normal is either possible or desirable because we are going to discover some new things that excite us artistically and excite us in terms of our ability to maintain relationships with a broader public than ever before. We're not going to want to give those up even as we re-blend the new digital activity with traditional performance uh, experience. Um, then the other piece of that is getting people who are resistant to it to understand the value of being flexible in how we teach and learn. What we need to happen now is for the regulatory environment to facilitate that and what barriers that still exist to be softened and loosened to accommodate the needs and really expand access to people, expand access to all.